Hello, my name is Graham Shears and I'm the CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation. Welcome to the Epilepsy Foundation's first national available webinar, Epilepsy During the School Years. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome people from all over Australia, as well as some people who live outside Australia to this live event. Everyone joining us tonight has personal experience of epilepsy. We have parents, guardians, siblings, grandparents and other extended family members here today. We also have teachers and support workers joining us tonight and I welcome you all. Tonight's webinar is being filmed and will be accessible online in the coming weeks. So should anyone participating tonight need to leave early because of other commitments, please be assured you'll be able to access the webinar in its entirety and at a time that suits you very soon. While we have a diverse audience here tonight, what everyone has in common is that each of you have joined us to learn more about what it means to have epilepsy during the school years. You've joined us to discover some tips and strategies for making your children's education journey as positive and fulfilling as possible. Tonight's webinar will explore some of the education, learning and social engagement impacts that living with epilepsy can have on children and young people. In addition, this live webinar will provide practical strategies aimed at positively enhancing the experiences of children and young people with epilepsy during the important schooling years. The webinar will combine information from clinical and research perspectives, as well as lived experience. Like you, the Epilepsy Foundation is committed to ensuring that children and young people living with epilepsy reach their potential. And we'll continue to advocate, advocate for the rights of children with government with education providers and with the wider community. The Epilepsy Foundation was founded in Victoria in 1964 and works to ensure that no one with epilepsy goes it alone. This means we're here to support children, young people and adults who live with epilepsy. We're also here to support all those who care for somebody who lives with epilepsy. Parents, carers, family members, teachers and other community members. And the Epilepsy Foundation is a member of Epilepsy Australia. Our goal as an organisation is to stop avoidable deaths, to ensure children with epilepsy receive a good education, ensure that people with epilepsy enter and remain in employment, and to reduce epilepsy related stigma in the community. We're also here to assist all those affected with epilepsy to feel safe and connected. Put simply, we want the entire community to be epilepsy smart. We believe that if more Australians understand epilepsy and those who live with epilepsy, the condition uh, and this condition will have a chance to live the way they want. The Epilepsy Foundation exists to assist us individuals and their families throughout the whole of their life. We work with researchers, medical specialists and healthcare workers to ensure that the support and information we provide is current, grounded in evidence and impactful. As an organisation, we're working to ameliorate the impact of epilepsy in the lives of people who live with or are affected by it. And we believe that supporting children and young people during the school years is critical. Equally, we believe that providing support to parents and carers is a way that we can assist families affected by epilepsy and ensure that you are not alone. We also believe it's critical that Australian schools and teachers are epilepsy smart so that those who have a duty of care for a child living with epilepsy know how they too can best support their learning and well-being in the classroom and in the play playground. So enhancing the lives of children and young people living with epilepsy is why we're running tonight's seminar, webinar. It's also why we've developed Epilepsy Smart Schools program. Before I pass over to tonight's presenters, I'd just like to take a moment to tell you about the Epilepsy Smart Schools program which commenced in Victoria in 2015. And I'm thrilled to tell you all that just last week, the Epilepsy Smart Schools program was launched as a national initiative. The Epilepsy Smart Schools program is a set of tools and resources for schools, families, and students, so that schools across Australia can become epilepsy smart. So what's an Epilepsy Smart School? It's a school that embeds inclusive, safe, and educationally sound practices for primary, secondary and special school students living with epilepsy. There are three broad aims to achieve in becoming an epilepsy smart school. Firstly, 
that school staff are aware of a student with an epilepsy diagnosis and that a current epilepsy management plan exists. Additionally, for those students living with epilepsy who have been prescribed emergency medication, that a current emergency medication management plan or an EMMP is held. Secondly, that school staff understand the possible impact of epilepsy on students and their learning, ideally through participating in epilepsy training. Where a student has an EMMP, that all school staff with a duty of care responsibility for that student have, a stu have received student-specific epilepsy training. And the third component is that school staff educate students about epilepsy using resources from the Epilepsy Smart Schools website, either through embedding education within the curriculum or a school-supported awareness raising campaign. As the Epilepsy Smart, Smart Schools program has now been launched nationally, over the coming year we will be supporting epilepsy organisations in all states and territories to influence government to introduce nationally consistent standards in relation to epilepsy and seizure policies in Australian schools. Such policy would mean that all schools have plans in place to best support students with epilepsy from a learning and safety perspective. This would also supply, this would also include any school staff who have a duty of care for a student with epilepsy by taking part in formal epilepsy training. I encourage you all to have a look at the Epilepsy Smart Schools website with the address now up on screen. There is great information and resources for schools, teachers, families and students to use and you'll be able to find your state member of the Epilepsy Australia who can support you in your area. I also encourage you to let your ch child's school know about the Epilepsy Smart Schools initiative and website in case they aren't already aware of it. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our presenters tonight. Firstly, hear from Dr. Silvana McAuliffe. Silvana is a senior cl clinical neuropsychologist at Austin Health and Monash Health. She also works in private practice. Silvana has worked in the area of paediatric epilepsy for more than 15 years. Over this time, she's developed a passion for helping children and families cope with the various challenges often associated with epilepsy. Her PhD study investigated the psychosocial impact of childhood epilepsy and epilepsy surgery. After Silvana's presentation, you'll then hear from Rihanna Nation. Rihanna's son was diagnosed with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy five years ago at the age of 12. Over this time, Rihanna's son and family have balanced living with epilepsy and its treatment with issues related to education and social engagement. Rihanna also works as a support worker here at the Epilepsy Foundation, bringing together her lived experience and professional background as a social worker to support living, people living with epilepsy and all those who care for them. Prior to working at the Epilepsy Foundation, Rihanna worked as a social worker in the Department of Veteran Affairs in the Veterans and Veterans Family Counselling Service. This role saw Rihanna support military veterans living with post-traumatic stress disorder and their families. I'd like to thank Silvana and Rihanna for giving up their time tonight to share their knowledge expertise and experience regarding epilepsy during the school years. So now I'll pass you over to our first presenter, presenter Dr. Silvana McAuliffe. Okay, thank you very much, Graham, and a big thank you to the Epilepsy Foundation for inviting me to be part of this very special webinar. It's wonderful to be here to um, discuss this very important topic of epilepsy during the school years. So in terms of the broad aim of my presentation this evening, I'd like to explore uh, some of the psychosocial challenges associated with epilepsy during the school years. So what does it mean for children to have epilepsy during primary school and secondary school? And we're going to be looking at a number of areas. Uh, firstly, the impact on children's social and emotional function, as well as their education and learning. We're also going to look at the impact on parents and caregivers. Um, this is an area that doesn't get a lot of airplay, but I think uh, probably really needs to be discussed in a lot more detail, so we'll be touching on that. And then finally, we'll be looking at some practical strategies and recommendations, um, which I'm hoping will be um, helpful to a lot of you. All right, so to understand the impact of epilepsy on children and families, we need to move beyond seizures. So we need to consider the real life impact of epilepsy and how it impacts children's quality of life. 
So over the last 10 or 20 years, the field of childhood epilepsy has really shifted. So traditionally, we used to always look at children's seizure frequencies um, and seizure counts. And over the last one or two decades, the focus has really shifted to look at the impact uh, at an everyday level on children. And research has done this in a qualitative fashion by seeking out the perspective of children themselves, including very young children, as well as their parents. And we've asked them uh, about their experience of epilepsy. And what I'll do tonight is draw on some of that qualitative research and present to you some of the common themes and common experiences that children and their parents describe. Now what this research shows very clearly is that adjustment to epilepsy is complex. So there's nothing simple about it. It's a complex process of adjustment and there are a lot of variables involved. So the experience of epile epilepsy occurs within an important medical, developmental, social and family context. And so in order for us to understand how an individual child experiences epilepsy, we need to be aware of these very many variables that might be at play for any given case. So the specifics of this slide are not um, particularly important, just to, to show you that there are a lot of variables involved. Um, so from a medical point of view, we have um, important epilepsy related variables, so how severe a child's seizures are, um, how frequent they are and so on and so forth. Some children also have comorbidities or associated conditions such as intellectual disability, global developmental delay for example, and this obviously impacts um, the child. There are also important child variables, um, family variables and community variables which include school support. Um, and these in turn impact the child's quality of life. And then of course, depending on the child's quality of life, this will then impact um, again, back again onto the child, the family and the broader community, inc including the school. So this is just to show you that um, there are lot, lots of uh, factors involved. Um, there's a very complex interplay of factors. And depending on what kind of variables are at play for any given individual with epilepsy, uh, the experience of epilepsy will be vastly different. And in fact, two children with exactly the same epilepsy diagnosis may experience that epilepsy in, in, in a very different way, depending on the specific variables at play. All right, so I think it's really important to also consider the, the developmental context within which children operate. So we know that the primary and secondary school years are a time of enormous neurodevelopmental growth. It's a time when children acquire a diverse set of skills, uh, so physical skills, social, emotional, cognitive and academic skills. Um, and these skills are acquired through both formal and informal learning. So while children will obviously follow very different developmental paths, um, researchers have identified age-specific developmental tasks that are typically faced by individuals at particular um, phases of development. So large-scale studies of normally developing children, for example, have shown that in infancy and early childhood, um, most children will learn to walk, learn to talk, and learn to form relationships with family. As children uh, transition to primary school, so during the middle childhood years, um, they need to learn physical skills for playing games, so both fine motor skills and gross motor skills, so that they can interact socially with their peers. They need to also develop school-related skills, um, so basic academics of reading, writing, counting and so forth. And increasingly over the primary school years, they attain a level of independence. So they try, they, they try and find their feet a little, if, if, if you will, and peers become important, um, and increasingly so over the primary school years. So the importance of fitting in with, peer, with uh, peers becomes all important particularly towards the latter stage of uh, primary school. As children then transition to secondary school, um, the emotional independence from parents becomes all that more important um, and they establish relationships with their peers of both sexes. And really uh, during the secondary school years, peer relationships are incredibly important um, and the need to, to definitely fit in uh, becomes quite um, prominent. Children with epilepsy view themselves and their illness and others within this very important developmental context. 
Um, and so I think in order for us to understand the experience of epilepsy, we need to know that it occurs against this developmental background. So in addition to tackling these normative developmental tasks, children with epilepsy must also contend with the challenges associated with their condition. Um, and for many, this, this means, um, th this, this creates you know, far reaching and longer term um, issues for children, some children with epilepsy. So let's have a look at uh, what is the impact of epilepsy on the school aged child. So if we look at the impact on emotional adjustment, um, we know one of the defining features of epilepsy is its unpredictability and uncertainty. Um, so as a result, children with epilepsy live their lives never really knowing uh, when a seizure might occur and if, um, when or if uh, ever their seizures will go away. Now this of course results in a sense of loss of control um, over their bodies and life events in general um, and therefore leads to a sense of insecurity and, and helplessness. Um, and even for children with very good seizure control, um, the, the, uh, I guess the concern and the uncertainty of whether their seizures might recur uh, is ever present. So this is an issue uh, not only for children who have poorly controlled seizures, but also those who are well controlled. Um, the uncertainty of epilepsy brings with it intense worry and fear. So um, having a seizure in public is um, very scary. Uh, we know that seizures can be quite frightening and particularly for children who choose not to disclose their epilepsy um, they c experience considerable anxiety about being found out and about how they might then be subsequently perceived and treated, um, particularly by their peers. Um, seizures can also be embarrassing, so some children lose bladder control um, in the course of having a seizure, which is um, particularly embarrassing. And older children um, tend to worry about the uncertainty of their future. So will, will, example, will, for example, um, epilepsy impact their ability to leave home, um, have children and choose certain careers as well. All right, so from an emotional and behavioural uh, point of view, we know uh, research shows that the overall risk for emotional and behavioural problems is three to nine times higher in children with um, epilepsy compared to non-epilepsy comparison groups and as well as compared to children with other chronic conditions such as asthma and diabetes. So we know that children with epilepsy are at increased risk uh, for things like anxiety, depression, uh, moodiness, including irritability and frustration, um, hyperactivity and aggression. And of course, a lot of these things may also relate to um, medication side effects as well. So socially, many children with epilepsy describe a profound sense of social isolation. So the sense that others don't quite understand what they're going through. And research shows that children with epilepsy uh, tend to have fewer friends and up to a third um, can experience moderate difficulties establishing peer relationships. There may also be exclusionary behaviour, so some children with epilepsy describe being uh, labelled or teased and or bullied because of their epilepsy, and some are actively rejected because of their epilepsy. Not surprisingly, this is, uh, results in quite a loss of self-confidence and poor self-esteem, and so much so that some children with epilepsy actually choose to withdraw socially and isolate themselves um, and restrict their social interactions. All right, um, children with epilepsy also commonly describe limitations on their daily activities. Um, now these limitations can be imposed by others such as their parents, but they might also be imposed by children themselves. And there are obvious age specific differences in the limitations that children experience. So younger children talk about things like not being able to sleep over friends' houses um, because of their seizures. Um, or having to interrupt play activities to take their medication, which they find frustrating. For older teenagers, um, there are immediate or future concerns regarding, um, for example, going to nightclubs, uh, drinking alcohol and learning to drive, which is often a very difficult one. 
Um, now these restrictions are often related to the need to manage or avoid trigger, seizure triggers. So for example, um, if sleep deprivation is a trigger for um, a child's seizures, then something like a sleepover or um, staying up late at night um, needs to be avoided. Um, and some children, because of their lack of self-confidence, um, prefer not to engage in these activities um, for fear of having a seizure in these situations. So this leads obviously to a loss of independence, which children um, experience as very um, acute and distressing. Um, and th they describe, children with epilepsy often describe a degree of anger and frustration about having epilepsy and all of these limitations that come with the, the condition. And for some children, um, this is compounded by what they describe as overprotective parents who insist on very high levels of monitoring and, and limit setting, which uh, compounds the situation for them. All right, so if we look now at the impact on education and learning. So when a child with epilepsy attends primary or secondary school, the school obviously needs to respond to that child. Um, and some children with epilepsy and their parents describe that there is a lack of understanding of epilepsy um, at the school level um, and how it is best managed. Um, so many children describe that teachers, for example, might overreact um, in order to ensure their safety um, or that they might be segregated for safety reasons uh, within the school. Apart from the safety concerns, there's also a reported lack of knowledge about the educational impact um, of epilepsy and how best to support a child's learning. Now, unfortunately, a lot of these issues, um, so both from a safety point of view and also um, uh, providing knowledge about the child's educational impacts, um, is often left to parents to tackle with the school system and to navigate the school system. Um, and this obviously takes time and effort and many parents describe it as quite an exhausting process. And it often happens, unfortunately, in the context of limited uh, resources and funding support. Um, and and it, is, it com becomes quite a difficult uh, situation for some parents. From a learning perspective, we know that epilepsy um, impacts children's physical and mental availability to learn. Um, so some children will have seizures in class, such as absence seizures, and that, that means that they miss important information um, and they have to then pick up from where they've left. Some children will have seizures at night, which will obviously cause daytime drowsiness, and um, others will have seizures in the morning, which will impact their learning during the day. Some children have uh, missed school days, so if they have a seizure in the morning, for example, um, and they have quite a protracted recovery process, they miss uh, school days. Or some children make it to school but then need to leave early. There's also the uh, need to attend medical appointments and so forth, which um, impacts uh, school attendance as well. Children commonly describe that it's hard to uh, concentrate during the school day um, or get homework done at night, and that's primarily related to uh, fatigue associated with epilepsy. Some children also describe that the intense concentration it takes to follow um, is absolutely exhausting, and um, in some cases, uh, that intense concentration can actually trigger seizure activity as well. Now, because of all of these issues, um, children with epilepsy really can't rely on a continuous and integrated learning experience. So parents will often describe to me that their child um, has good and bad days at school. And during a bad patch of seizures or with, with very um, bad uh, side effects from medication, um, it impacts their learning. So they may uh, struggle to learn new concepts, or if they do learn them, then there's a need to then repeat those concepts the following day. So there's no carryover from day to day, um, particularly in, in a bad patch of seizures, for example. So the experience of epilepsy in the classroom means that the, that the child's learning is not continuous and it's not an integrated one, and that's quite a common uh, situation that parents describe. There are, of course, many variables that um, contribute to cognitive and learning problems in children with epilepsy. 
So as I suggested, the, the very act of thinking and concentrating uh, for some children uh, acts as a trigger for seizures. We also know, of course, that uh, seizures themselves or the epilepsy syndrome that the child may have um, may be associated with cognitive changes as well. There may be side effects from medications, so these include things like fatigue, forgetfulness and so on, which uh, obviously impact learning. Learning, miss, learning time missed, um, for example, uh, not being able to attend school or having to leave early. Some children who have comorbid conditions such as ADHD or autism, for example, um, have their own learning concerns quite apart from epilepsy. And then of course the role of um, mood and social problems um, impacting the efficiency with which children can learn as well. So there are a lot of uh, variables at play. So because of all those variables, there's no real kind of single cognitive profile that exists for children with epilepsy. So there's a very wide spectrum of cognitive profiles. Um, and they can range from relatively specific impairments in one cognitive domain, such as memory, for example, to quite severe and profound generalised intellectual disability. So um, it's a varied picture. If we look at the common neuropsychological um, problems that I encounter as a neuropsychologist, in my um, experience, poor attention and concentration uh, would have to be the most common um, and related to that uh, learning and memory difficulties. Some children with epilepsy also show slowed processing speed, so their ability to think quickly um, is sometimes slowed. Um, and some children also have some executive or higher order difficulties, so things like novel problem solving, planning, organisational difficulties and so forth. And because of those difficulties, um, these can impact academic um, uh, function as well, so reading, writing, spelling, maths and so on. So by way of summary, um, if we take the seizures that, that children experience and all of the challenges that come with those seizures um, that we've described, so things like the social isolation, some of the cognitive issues, the school's response to those issues, as well as the emotional um, impacts of e epilepsy, we can really understand and begin to understand how epilepsy may act as a barrier to normality for children with uh, the condition. And these challenges have important implications for a child's self-identity, so their perception of who they are as, as people. And many children with epilepsy maintain a view of themselves as not normal and different because of all of these various challenges. Now this of course occurs at a time uh, in their development where their desire to be normal and to fit in is, is so important um, and is such an important part of their social development. Um, so epilepsy and seizures very much set children apart um, and greatly impact their ability to fit in. Um, now this negative sense of self as different and, and not normal um, serves to reinforce their negative experience of the condition um, and also impacts their ability to cope with their condition. The children I see in my clinic um, keep saying to me, I, you know, I just want to be normal, Silvana. And, uh, and I guess this is important for us to keep in mind, um, particularly if we're trying to help the child uh, deal as best as they can with their condition. All right, so now let's move on to looking at the impact of uh, epilepsy, childhood epilepsy on parents and caregivers. For some children um, and families, the process of diagnosis may be complicated and quite drawn out, and for some, quite a traumatic process. Once a diagnosis is made, then there are challenges associated with treatment. So there's the challenge of finding the right doctor, for example. And then once we've found the right doctor, there's a trial and error process in terms of trying to find um, the proper medication, um, usually medication for the child. Now this of course is an evolving process, so as the child has growth spurts, for example, um, that trial and error process needs to start again and levels of medication need to be altered and so forth. There are also honeymoon periods, um, so a child may respond favourably to a medication uh, for a short period of time and then have breakthrough seizures, which you know, is an incredibly frustrating process for families um, to cope with. And of course there's that, that balance between reduced seizure frequency versus side effects, so getting that balance right um, is often very difficult for uh, families as well. 
The emotional effects um, on families are paramount. Um, so universally, um, parents and caregivers describe a constant state of worry um, and related to having a child with epilepsy. And, and that state of worry is pervasive um, and, and has a lot of uh, components to it. So there, there are a lot of worries. So for example, when will the next seizure occur? For example, um, how can I ensure my child's safety? Um, how do I maintain constant supervision, vigilance or monitoring of the child? And when the parent can't be physically present, then how am I able to leave the child with others, um, including teachers, for example, and trusting that they will be okay? So these are the kind of varied worries that accompany um, many parents uh, who have a child who has epilepsy. And many parents speak about a roller coaster of emotions as well. So when seizures are relatively well controlled um, and things are fairly settled, the child's having a good response to medication, everything's you know, on, a, on, a, on, on an even kill, um, and then all it takes is one seizure um, for the cards to come tumbling down and then the anxiety uh, re-emerges. Um, and so there's this, this constant roller coaster of emotions for parents and families. So we know that epilepsy, childhood epilepsy can cause stress for parents and caregivers. Um, just like children, um, parents also experience the uncertainty of seizures and the helplessness attached to that. A lot of parents speak about anger, uh, not being able to stop or do anything to assist their child. And there's that ever-present fear. Um, so there's the insecurity of long-term prognosis. So if my child's seizures are to continue, then what are the longer term prognosis? What's the longer term prognosis for the child? Um, and there's a real fear about regression or the child deteriorating over time as well. Um, many parents share in the anxiety um, of their child, um, so the day to day challenges faced by the child. And this is all encompassing and can um, affect the parent physically. So with uh, by way of lack of sleep, fatigue, exhaustion and so on. All the while parents need to try and be strong for their child um, and also attend to everything and everyone else um, in the family as well. So it is a highly stressful situation um, that most parents discuss. For some parents, epilepsy causes stress, but for some, uh, epilepsy causes distress. Um, and for those in distress, there is a real risk of clinical anxiety and depression. Um, and this is especially common um, amongst mothers of children with epilepsy. There are also some uh, important social factors. So parents with uh, children who have epilepsy often describe a sense of isolation. Uh, with, with having a child who has epilepsy. So the feeling that other parents' priorities and experiences are vastly different from their own. Um, and in fact, some, some also describe feeling quite resentful um, of others who don't really understand their lot in life. There is undeniably um, still a stigma attached to the diagnosis of epilepsy, and this certainly feeds into this sense of isolation. And there are some parents who choose not to disclose their child's epilepsy. Um, for fear of their child being exposed to that level of uh, stigma. Um, some parents are unable to work because they're having to be around uh, in case the child has a seizure and this obviously impacts at a financial level and, and creates additional stress for some parents as well. There are also disruptions to family roles and responsibilities. So mothers will often describe that they assume the role of healthcare provider rather than mother. Um, and this certainly impacts um, the roles and responsibilities uh, within the family system. Um, siblings are often um, needing to take on the role of protector and monitor, um, especially during the school day uh, as well. And that includes younger siblings as well. There are often changed relationships within the family, um, marital relationships, uh, siblings are often um, have their own emotional issues um, and, and their own uh, concerns about the, the, as a direct result of having a, a brother or sister with epilepsy. 
And then of course there's the challenge of parenting a child uh, who has epilepsy. And parents will often ask me, you know, am I being too soft or too hard on the child with epilepsy? So it's a really hard, um, hard to get that parenting role right. Um, and I guess the, getting the balance right uh, is, is a difficult thing. So that balance of letting children have a normal childhood um, and yet having that fear of letting them go. And this is, you know, a balance that's very difficult even um, for parents who don't have children with epilepsy. But putting epilepsy in the mix just amplifies it and, and makes it so much more difficult. Um, older children in particular, um, you know, for, for children who are well and truly into secondary school, who are so desperate to have their own space and independence and wanting to feel, um, you know, separate from their parents and fit in with their peers, um, you know, that's at odds with their parents who, who need and want to maintain this constant level of supervision and protection because of their seizures. Um, and so this obviously causes enormous difficulty for older, for, ch for parents of older children with epilepsy. All right, so finally, we're just going to move on now to look at some practical strategies and recommendations. Um, I think firstly, education is incredibly important. So that is for everyone. So uh, you as parents, um, your child with epilepsy and really all family me members. Clearly that needs to be an age appropriate level of understanding, but I think it's really important that everyone in the family understands what epilepsy is, how it's treated, what to expect. And I think this helps for everyone to feel a sense of control uh, or more in control of epilepsy um, than without that kind of education behind them. I think it's important, um, if appropriate, to empower your child to educate others, um, including their classmates. Um, not only about their seizures, but also by doing so to address some of the misconceptions um, about epilepsy and just to demystify the condition, you know, so some children have asthma, some children have diabetes, I have epilepsy. Um, so it just breaks down some of that stigma attached to the condition and I think that's, that's a really important thing as well. I think it's really important to find a strong doctor that you trust. Um, so whether that's a GP, a paediatrician, a paediatric neurologist. And I guess if we're not feeling um, like we completely trust the doctor, then insisting on a second opinion uh, if that's relevant as well. I think advocating for your child at every turn is uh, incredibly important, asking questions, more and more questions of everyone, be that you know doctors, teachers, psychologists, whoever, um, really being the voice piece for your child and really going with your gut. You know, if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right um, and acting on that as well. I think it's really important to inform teachers um, from purely a safety point of view, you know, the teachers need to know the specific nature of your child's seizures um, and um, their treatment and how seizures affect uh, your child um, and really what to do if a seizure occurs. Um, to ensure the, the safety of the child. And quite apart from the safety issues, um, I think it's really important to discuss how, impact, how epilepsy affects um, your child's learning ability and then also impacts them emotionally, socially and behaviourally. Um, Graham mentioned the Epilepsy Smart School program, um, which is an excellent program and one that uh, should really be considered uh, if it hasn't um, at the school level uh, in informing teachers and staff generally. If you are concerned about academic and learning problems, I think um, don't wait. You know, the earlier you get onto it, the better. Um, I think it's really important to talk to your doctor. It could well be that, you know, a mild, minor change in medication may lead to less fatigue, which will increase the efficiency of their cognition and cognitive and learning skills. If appropriate, uh, perhaps seeing a psychologist might be useful, getting a very detailed assessment um, of the child's strengths and weaknesses and how that may help. Again, talking to your children's, uh, children's teacher and asking for help, so um, specifically talking about uh, things like individual learning plans, how uh, accommodations can be made within the classroom uh, to, to tailor uh, the child's strengths and weaknesses, and really getting lots of um, assistance with um, how we go about getting support for, child, for the child, um, including special considerations, particularly for children who are towards the end of their um, secondary school years, uh, special considerations are, are very important um, to investigate. 
if there are any emotional or behavioural concerns and you feel that they're significantly impacting your child's everyday function, very important to seek professional help. Um, and you know, a GP, psychologist or psychiatrist may be able to help with adjustment and coping. If there are social concerns, again, speaking to your children's teacher, um, I think making sure that they're aware uh, is very important. Uh, perhaps the school counsellor or psychologist may be able to assist. Really encouraging the child to avoid isolating themselves from others and if they have at least just one person that they can talk to and feel safe uh, with at the school level, I think that's very important. Um, you may want to think about engaging them in social groups, whether they're camps or local youth groups. They don't necessarily need to be epilepsy specific um, and possibly some formal social skills training uh, programs as well. I think within the family it's important to address and talk about everyone's reactions to, to epilepsy. Um, I think the lines of communication need to be open at all times. Encouraging children to talk about uh, how they're experiencing epilepsy and, and their seizures. As much as possible I think it's really important to maintain a level of normality. Um, so clearly once you deal with safety concerns then keeping things as normal as possible for your child is, is so very important and re-evaluating restrictions on activities. So rather than saying no, uh, perhaps investigating if there are any other options. Um, and trying to find the right mix, I guess, between hovering over, over the child and then letting them lead their normal life. And I guess for an older child, you know, we can workshop that um, and try to find a, a happy medium that works for both um, parent and child. Within the family, I think it's important to foster a, a can-do attitude. We know from research that children who cope well with seizures and epilepsy have a real sense of resilience. So that ability to cope with adversity and, and, um, and, and keep moving forward despite it taking control and really celebrating little accomplishments. So a day without a seizure is a fantastic day and celebrating that as well. I think it's important for parents to talk to close family and friends about your own frustrations and anxieties and seek out opportunities to connect with others in a similar situation. So that may be, for example, engaging with the Epilepsy Foundation or any other local epilepsy organisation um, or even online supports, which are often very helpful. Sharing the caring role um, so that you can have some regular time to look after yourself and self-nurture is also very important. And I guess if you are concerned that you may be having some emotional difficulties that are in the clin clinical range, then seeking out professional help um, via GP, psychologist or psychiatrist. All right, I'm going to hand over now to Rihanna. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. So now I'm, my name's Rihanna, obviously, and I'm now going to talk about my son's journey, um, Sam, and you can see him in the picture there with his dog, Chloe. Um, so my journey actually begins with Sam in primary school, then moves through the middle school years and then in through the senior school years, with Sam's now 17 in his final year of school. So it really aligns itself well with what Silvana has just spoken to you all about. So hopefully you'll have some idea of and maybe some ideas from what I have to offer today. So Sam had his first seizure um, at around 11, 12 years old um, when I dropped him off at school one day. Um, he was dropped at school and um, I went to work and then 10 minutes later I was contacted saying that Sam had fainted. Um, unfortunately, we'd found that he'd actually had his first tonic clonic seizure. We at that time lived in the Northern Territory. If you're going to be having this kind of diagnosis, why not go remote, we thought. And um, so in Darwin we were. Um, there's no neurologists in Darwin. There's one public hospital and we were lucky enough to be connected with an amazing paediatrician. Um, Sam was diagnosed after his second um, tonic clonic seizure, which myself and my husband witnessed with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. At this stage, Sam is still only 12. In the picture you can see Sam played football for the local football team. Um, his broken collarbone was not due to a seizure but in fact due to a rather good tackle from a teammate and it must have been catching on the day because two of them got hit at the same time. Um, so you can see that Sam was able to enjoy normal activities or we perceived to be normal um, even though early on in his diagnosis he was actually having seizures on the football field. 
Um, when that happens, the game would stop, Sam's seizure would last for a couple of minutes, an ambulance would be called, and then the game would continue once he departed the location. So you can see we actually had really good support around that from the football um, club that he participated in. It wasn't an easy um, emotional start to our lives and I can remember that Sam at 12 and 13 was still wanting some kind of independence and um, I would secretly follow him to his friend's place by hiding behind trees so he felt that he was going alone and I would be doing my secret squirrel thing on the way through. Um, I couldn't fool him and he would often say, Mum, I can see you, just come out of there. Um, so you can see that my anxiety levels were quite significant. Um, I actually resigned from my job to the amount of seizures that Sam was having and I've only recently returned to work in last year in November. So that's three years of being unemployed due to my choice and our choice through discussion, but we just felt at the time that was what was best for Sam. Um, the school's response initially with the primary school was good, but they were scared and they admitted to being scared because they didn't have another child at that time with epilepsy. Um, and it was about us educating them. Um, it was new to us, so how did we as a family educate something that we didn't actually know about much ourselves? So I did a lot of research. I suppose luckily being a social worker, this enabled me to gather that information. And we developed strategies and approaches to coping with things and the change that had now developed our lives. Unfortunately, the anxiety hit me the hardest. Um, my son Sam coped quite well with it. Um, my husband, who's quite level-headed, coped well. He's an engineer and academic, so you can see. So I was the emotional string within the group. We put cameras in our son's room um, and I slept on the lounge with the camera, uh, with the uh, laptop next to me and every movement um, I woke and checked in on Sam. Sam has not had one nocturnal seizure in his whole diagnosis. They all happen on early mornings at generally between eight and nine in the morning or whether he's overheated or placed in stress. So I have no idea why I had these fitful nights of sleep watching this video recorder for um, months and months on end until my son said enough is enough, I need some privacy and that includes closing the door on the shower. So primary school was hard for us um, as we learnt about the diagnosis and how it was going to impact on us and how we would explain things to the school. So middle school years. So I talk about the middle school years, which isn't so um, strong here in Australia, but at that time as a military family, we had been posted to the United States. Um, this was a nerve-wracking time as our diagnosis was new. Sam was um, only on Epilim at that time, but was um, having, still having tonic-clonic seizures and he'd just started having absent seizures. Um, however, with the guidance of our amazing paediatrician in Darwin, he felt that it was quite confident for us to go. So off we went to America and was the first time that we actually had linked in with a um, neurologist. Sam had not seen a neurologist prior to this, um, where we actually started having our full testing done and looking at the types of seizures Sam was having. At this stage, he was put on his second medication, which was Lamictal. And unfortunately, with Lamictal and Epilim together, um, Sam developed a significant tremor in his hand, which is part of one of the things that can happen with those two drugs together. And at that time, we were willing to cope with it due to the, um, the control over the seizures that it had. So Sam not only moved country, went to a different school, um, a very large school with over 2,000 students. Um, and we had to educate and emotionally adjust to the changes to a new country. Um, we sat down with Sam at this time and discussed how we would do that and he decided that he would like to do a presentation to all the teachers in a personal development if the school was willing to do so. So we approached them and they said yes, which is fabulous. Um, I gave a brief explanation and then Sam began his own presentation with me there guiding him um, as he talks through his experiences as a young person and the impact and how the school could support him. 
At this time, the school was really amazing. Um, once again, another country, so they were still unsure. However, they responded well. My anxiety increased twofold. I wasn't hiding behind trees anymore, um, thankfully. Um, however, I could hide behind large yellow buses, <laughs> which were the school buses. Um, and just standing there waiting for him to go in as his stresses and waiting for the next seizure and the anxiety was still there. Um, we set up a program where Sam would text me um, and say that he was home or that he was at school so that I knew that he was safe. Um, if I didn't get that text, then um, I would obviously ring him five, six, seven, probably 12 or 15 times. At this stage as a teenager, of course, he did not respond. And of course, my anxiety levels increased because I thought he might be on the side of the road having a seizure. And um, I would finally get hold of him. He'd go, no, mum, I was just in class. And of course, I can't ring in class. As a parent, you don't think logically with a child with epilepsy um, because these things cross your mind because it's always the fact, oh, has it happened again? Um, what's happened, what's he broken, what part of his body's hurt this time because of the large seizures that Sam unfortunately has been diagnosed with. It doesn't just um, impact the people around it. I mean, if he's on the road or whatever, he can lose skin. Um, he has actually bruised and nearly broken his jaw. Um, so it is quite an anxiety provoking process. Um, as Sam was growing, we really wanted to ensure that this was his journey and that he was empowered to tell his story. Um, and so we very much made it up to him about whether he wanted to share his journey with others. I'm very proud to say I have an amazing, resilient, strong and independent boy who was very much willing to tell his own story. At this time, we were starting to notice um, significant changes in Sam's learning abilities and around his memory. Um, as Silvana has um, already stated, their learning changes because of not only because of the medication but because of the seizures. Unfortunately, um, due to the medication, Sam became significantly tired. Um, he had a tremor and the seizures also it took him 24 to 48 hours to recover from any large tonic clonic seizure that he had. So that was up to two to three days out of school. So we decided while we're in the, new, um, the United States to have a neuropsychological evaluation that would assist us in assisting Sam to put things in place within different schools, but also specifically knowing that we were returning to Australia in that very you know, important year at the end of the year in his year 11 and 12, which um, is complicated at best of times for any um, adolescent. Um, but to add epilepsy onto that is quite significant. So at this time, we knew Sam's diagnosis is permanent. He will never outgrow it. It will always be part of who he is, um, but it does not define him. However, Sam will never be able to drive a car and is supposed to not have any alcohol. <laughs> and at this stage, I can guarantee that. But obviously, I won't be hiding behind trees when he's in his 20s and 30s. Well, I hope not anyway, because I'm sure that his girlfriends would be very, find it very strange. Um, but I'm hoping that um, Sam makes the right choice, and I think he will. However, it was about us educating him around and ensuring him that just because he couldn't drive, that he could still have that independence and the same social life about others um, that are his same age as well. Um, the impact on us as a family, the anxiety for me and for my husband, my husband just showed it a little bit differently, was still there. And I have to say it's still um, here today, even though I'm now um, working again. So now Sam is 17. He's done two years back in Australia, which is 16 and 17. Um, he still has a diagnosis of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Although his seizures are controlled, um, he still is having significant spikes within his brain. So every EEG, um, he's still having spikes. So they have added another medication. Unfortunately, his tremor has returned, but he has decided that that tremor is worth living with if it means no seizures. So once again, Sam continues to tell people of his epilepsy, pass the um, information on to schools. 
and we're now transitioning from paediatric care to an adult setting. This has been a very difficult time once again for me. Um, Sam has coped well. He now attends all his own um, GP appointments. He has a wonderful GP and he has an amazing neurologist where he attends those on his own. It's not an easy transition, um, but we've been fortunate enough to have a safe and well-guided transition. Sam is empowered. Um, he tells his story. I don't tell his story until today, obviously, but I'm sure that he would say the same things. He's frustrated. He gets angry. He does say, why me? Um, it's something that's part of it, um, but he understands that it's part of who he is, but it doesn't define him. He tells his school friends and he ensures that he's well supported on his own within his school environment. He's um, spoken to his teachers and with support from us, he now has special um, assistance within his exam so he's allowed a little bit of extra time and if he's feeling unsure he thinks he may be unwell he can actually leave the exam but they come back in. Um, so Sam has grown into like I said an amazing young man and I hope he continues his journey. I'm very proud of him and how he's coped with um, such a late diagnosis um, and I know that he doesn't have any other comorbidities, um, which has made our journey probably a little bit easier in some aspects, but it's still anxiety provoking. And I would have to say that probably for the rest of my life that I will have a little bit of anxiety at the pit of my stomach um, for any time that I'm not around Sam or not within close contact. But that doesn't mean I won't allow him to follow his dreams. So thank you. I'd like to now pass on to Graham. Um, just to say farewell. Thank you, Rihanna, and thank you, Savannah. Your presentations were just so informative, constructive, and your passions for assisting children and young people to reach their potential during school years was abundantly evident. I've no doubt that the practical tips, strategies, and ideas that you've um, provided will be of enormous benefit to the audience. And before I officially close tonight's webinar, I'd also like to thank UCB for partnering with us to deliver it. I'd like to thank Danielle from Atticus Media, who's filmed this evening's event. And I'd like to thank our friends who manage the International My Epilepsy Team social network for sharing information about tonight's webinar within their community. For those of you who are unfamiliar with My Epilepsy Team, it's a social networking platform that enables people living with epilepsy as well as carers to get emotional support from others, as well as current and up-to-date information relating to epilepsy and its treatment. So finally, I just want to remind participants that if this webinar has brought up any issues for you and you feel you need additional support, we do encourage you to speak to your health care provider, your local epilepsy organisation, or con alternatively contact Lifeline or Beyond Blue. So in closing, I'd like to remind you that the Epilepsy Foundation and the other Epilepsy Australian members are here to support you because we believe that no one with epilepsy should go it alone. Thank you and good night.